Hello and welcome to the Achama Pulse webcast. Great that you are with us here today to discuss some of the trends that shape and change the process industries. And you cannot just watch, but you can become an active part of this webcast. It's really easy. Go to Slido, put in the login, the hashtag Achama Pulse, and post your questions, and I will take them right here and ask our expert. So, what are we talking about today? Well, over the recent years, everything around us somehow has become smart. In everyday life, we have smart watches, smart phones, smart homes. And the same holds true for the process industry. We have smart sensors, smart reactors. And the next step from smart is intelligent. So intelligent is making, intelligence is making its way into the process industry. Artificial intelligence is something everybody's talking about, but I think it's a concept quite hard to grasp. And I'm really happy that today we have an expert here with us who can explain to us what artificial intelligence can do in the process industry and where we stand currently. So he's the Microsoft industry advocate for chemicals manufacturing and supply chain across EMEA and a long-standing sustainability and resource productivity expert. His focus is on impact generation from the Microsoft Cloud for manufacturing and partner ecosystems, including sustainability and AI applications. Before his current role, he was several years at McKinsey, and before that, he held positions in consulting and management in the technology sector. So welcome, Robert Feldman. Hello, uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you for the ability to participate in this super exciting topic, right? Uh, so we are ready to scale artificial intelligence and chemicals manufacturing now. Uh, AI is already commonplace, right? In many, many consumer applications and, uh, you know, from Alexa all the way to in-car navigation system that we're all using in everyday life. Uh, it's taking a bit longer in uh, the process industries because of the sheer complexity out there, right, to deal with it, but it's now getting ready to scale. And that's what uh, the focus will be like in the session on June 16th, uh, between 1 and 2 p.m. European time. So with that, uh, let me give you a bit of a sneak preview, right? So um, the areas we're going to talk about here, summarized on this slide, are, well, first of all, what is the actual AI opportunity out there in the chemicals industry? Um, what's the current situation? What are the challenges and the obstacles to scaling it up? Uh, and uh, what it could be a potential way forward? So the AI, uh, AI opportunity is basically to close the gap to perfection, right? Uh, we are already super advanced, uh, super automated. Uh, we have excellent systems running. But there's still this little bit of uh, things that worries us. Uh, there's fluctuations, there's things out there that we don't seem to be able to control too well. And we're not getting to the 100% for whatever reason. So AI can help there. Uh, the uh, issue of a resource productivity boost uh, is really what, what is the big benefit out there. Let's call it the killer application that gets us a 3 to 10% improvement there. Um, and uh, it's particularly good for brownfield plants because it avoids millions, millions of expensive uh, hardware investments, right? It's in the end software, it's a brain that's connected, uh, and that's relatively cheap and inexpensive to do with a fast payback and has a huge impact. Uh, that's what's super exciting about it. Now, the current situation is, yes, uh, that's not, not new, right? It's been recognized. However, it's hard to do. So there are, there's, however, quite a few successful pilots out there, right? Institutes, uh, studies, uh, startups, whatever. So AI, in principle, has been invented, right? So let's say the basis we have. We know that it can generate value. And uh, how, however, there is, of course, a very diverse uh, application space out there, many, many different trials. Uh, it's time to consolidate now, and this poses us what's the challenge, right? We have many one-offs. We don't yet have an industrial standardized approach, which uh, requires a scaling, for example, the enterprise resource planning and, and these things, CRM systems, all of those started equally, right? And they're now pretty standardized, uh, so we need to get there with AI. 
So the way forward is, is of course, and that's uh, where we, we are a major player in that, is to, in the way forward, to leverage the Microsoft Cloud for Manufacturing and the partner ecosystem. We're going to need AI black belts. People are really super knowledgeable in that space. We're going to need no-code tools, something like you know PowerPoint, Excel, AutoCAD uh, of that nature that you don't need to program anymore. You can just build AI with those tools. Uh, we need uh, pre-built modules that we can download and we can um, improve upon. That saves a lot of time. We need good learning and training. And we need also the, the thing of cyber maintenance. We need to maintain all of these new AI uh, engines, optimizers, just as we need to maintain many others. And that needs to be efficient. Just to give you a glimpse of what's running in the field, uh, these are partner solutions of Microsoft, which are running physically in plants which are delivering several million of Euro EBITDA benefit, which are massively reducing the CO2 emission footprint, avoiding CO2 tax cost. Um, those are running. So we're going to deep dive on that in the session on the 16th. And last but not least, uh, what is actually uh, enabling all of that? That is the Microsoft Cloud for Manufacturing, which was launched at Hanover Messe uh, recently. It's basically the suite of applications running on this common data backbone uh, in the cloud, in the edge, which is powering all these uh, applications from simple ones to highly advanced artificial intelligence applications which we are now able to do uh, economically efficiently, scaling it worldwide. So all of these things will be in focus on the session. I look very much forward to uh, seeing you there again and to the uh, interesting discussions. And now also very much I'm open to your question. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Robert. That was power right across a, a lot of topics that you mentioned there. And I think, um, well, we have seen a lot of potential applications for artificial intelligence. You mentioned that some of it is already there, but actually how much? Is it a common thing to use artificial intelligence in the process industry today, or is it more something that we expect to come? Uh, it's not common yet, uh, absolutely not. It's still an early stage, but it is at a stage where the things that have been built are really working. Right, So it's not that we're anymore in the laboratory R&D stage. We're beyond that now. We know, it, we know it works, but we just have it in one place, in one location. There's one sponsor behind it. There's an excited team behind it. But, you know, actually, we want it now 500 times, 1,000 times, and that's now the challenge, right? So I would say there's pockets, right? Uh, so it's not something abstract anymore but it's not commonplace. What we're doing commonly already quite well is operational visibility. We are showing uh, the, the data, we are visualizing them like uh, very nicely in plants using Power BI and other applications. We have some predictive uh, mathematical algorithms already deployed quite much in the field that can uh, already show us what's going to happen. And this is now, of course, a next step of evolution, which makes it more complex, more sophisticated, but uh, we are starting, right? It's we are ramping up that now aggressively. And I can, I can say if we don't do that and we're not participating, we're going to miss out because uh, competitors who do this faster are going to be way ahead. I mean, think of Amazon and the retail space. Think of, of, of automotive companies in the in the elect electric car space versus others that have taken on from the beginning an end-to-end -end data data approach, we can see that this makes a huge difference and in chemicals could be as well the same. If your competitor you know, is, is doing things uh, three to 10% more efficiently than you and making a bigger profit margin, that should affect you, all right? And that's, that's the point. Obviously, yes, that's really a big motivation, I think. Um, but what are so far the biggest hurdles? I think you mentioned in your presentation uh, brownfield plants, for example. Uh, you made it sound really easy, but uh, I think implementing artificial intelligence in brownfield plants means that I also have to have get all the data somewhere, um, which might be an obstacle. Or are there other hurdles as well? What are the main barriers? Yeah, look, funnily enough, data is, is exactly not the hurdle, right? This, this is the exciting thing about the process industry and chemicals. 
We have an unbelievable treasure trove of data because we started to invest in plant historians already a long, long time ago. So we have very detailed time series based data, except now they are in data vaults. They are stored away somewhere and forgotten, right? Mm -hmm. But what we can do, we can lift that treasure. So data is exactly not the problem. We have laboratory systems, limb systems with databases. Those data are also there. It's comparatively easy to get the data. It's not so easy to link and contextualize the data and map the data against uh, the, the processes, uh, the flows and all of that. That's why you need the engineers and the data scientists to sit together to map that. The mapping is a bit of work. Once it's done, it's there. And then you have what we call refined data, contextualized data. The next thing is the, the model creation. Now, fortunately enough, there's a few startups out there and we are working with them who already have these efficient tools to do that. So that's there as well. We are we need to invest now in people now, building out these black belt capabilities. So, so people who can do it. I'm not talking data scientists. I'm talking about a hybrid between data scientist and engineer. What we have learned is that data science alone cannot solve this. It's way too complex. Industrial engineering, chemical engineering in itself is a brutally sophisticated domain and mathematics as well. But if we bring them together in the right teams, in the right setups, and we install black belts and translators who guys are multi-skilled, they know about economics, they know about engineering, and they know about data science, that's the, that's the people we need. And we can train them up. And when we invest in that and we work with partners, then we can scale up. The tools are there, the platforms are there, the data is there, now we need to invest in people and in a smart program to roll this out, but it's possible. Okay, we have the first questions coming in from the audience. If you have more questions, post them on Slido and I will ask them right now, as I'm doing now. Um, data systems unfortunately have a reputation for being prone to hacker attacks. What about cybersecurity? Is this an issue that should be taken into account? Cyber security is a general issue affecting any sort of data, not only the data particularly that are being used in AI, right? So, so uh, cyber security affects what we call the data estates. So we have the financial administrative data estates and we have now the operational OT data estates, which are all these data. So cyber security is super important. Uh, there is a, of course, every enterprise needs to protect itself and that is daily business, right? The, uh, so that's no difference. Um, the other issue is about cybersecurity when you work with the cloud. That topic is being addressed super, super powerful and super, super, with super high attention levels, right? And uh, it's coming ever more to the attention that the cloud is actually probably much safer than enterprise environments for the reason that cloud uh, is, uh, lifeblood depends on cloud providers that it works. And when there's the tiniest bug, uh, hundreds of people are put to, to fix it immediately, while you in the enterprise might not even discover yet that you even have a problem, right? So I think the, the, the awareness is, is starting to happen that actually, Cloud, Cloud Edge and all this stuff can be actually possibly even safer than the enterprise environment. But of course, retrofitting and upgrading your cybersecurity all the time is anyway mandatory, right? But it's not an AI specific topic. It's a generic data estate specific topic, I would say. And it extends also to everyday life as probably a lot yes. of companies have already experienced. Um, if you'd like to stop sharing your screen, that, that'd be fine because then our participants can see you better. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Yeah, great, Maybe. perfect. Um, another question. We, well, we, we have for, for decades, we have been very proud of our, uh, about our engineering capabilities. So what has AI to offer that advanced engineering cannot do by itself? Yeah, this is a very good question. I would say now there's a spectrum out there of problems to solve. There's uh, one type of problems that you can describe very, very well with mathematical formulas, right? Um, and there's another phenomenon of, out there, which is called heuristic stochastic uh, stuff, which is just random. It's just variations and all of that. The, um, the normal stuff we have, we are very mature in that, right? To describing things with formulas, we're very mature. 
unfortunately, particularly in chemicals, the world, there's no straight line, right? <laughs> in biology, in chemicals, whatever. It, unfortunately, we have clouds of data. We have these famous data clouds, and we're trying to approximate what's happening with approximation of formulas and so on. Uh, when you try to model uh, pyrotechnical processes, other things, you just are you at the limit what regular mathematics can do. And pattern recognition and machine learning pattern recognition, uh, that is a principle that you can apply to just about any signal. It can be a video, photo signal, and then it's digital signals. So the beauty we have in chemicals, we have so many signals there that honestly, the idea to apply that is actually coming from the financial world. Think about it. When you have a stock chart that is wildly fluctuating and you have all these things happening in the financial market, how is that different from a chemical signal and a temperature signal in a process? Not really. So the same logic that you can apply for mathematics trading of stock market, metadata and stock, you can apply that same principle to chemical signals uh, it's indifferent. And this technology has been developed originally in the financial markets, right? Stock trading is done by computers already a long time ago. So we are, all we're doing is we're bringing it basically over to chemistry and to, to the engineering. It's nothing else. It's just basically engineering. Sorry to say that it's a bit of a late starter to adopt these technologies, but elsewhere they're already running a long time. Military, everywhere, this stuff is already running. So uh, uh, the message is, this is mature technology, it's proven it works and we should adopt it and we can adopt it and it complements the conventional way of doing it. Great. Another question from the audience, keep posting. It's very interesting and you're, to hear your thoughts as well. Um, how much artificial intelligence can a chemical plant tolerate? With other words, will we have plants without operators one day? Um, I think artificial intelligence is one topic. The other topic is automation, right? So automation per se is nothing new. It's an ongoing process, right? So it's not AI or automation. AI is just the next logical evolution of automation, right? Because you can automate by, say, by giving commands, if, then, on, off, right? This kind of rules-based automation, that's, that's anyway already running. and It's been around a long time. The only difference now is that we can now uh, do a, take automation to the next level that it's not a fixed set of rules, but it's a condition-based decision that is taken at that moment, given on the data and the knowledge you have at that particular moment. Think of your car. When your car tells you, take a right turn now, you have to do it now. And now at this moment, it's calculating that the traffic on that route is better than on the other route, right? And that now the data constellation is such that that type of a recommendation comes out. And the only thing you're doing then is connecting this kind of a decision to, let's say, in an automated self-driving car, you're just connecting it with the commands to, to the car. That's the only difference. And so you have basically automated a complex decision, right, in the self-driving car and in the, in the plant. Uh, you have the same, except in the plant it's easier because the plant doesn't move. It stays fixed in place. The car is much more complex because it moves all the time. So it's just an evolution of automation, nothing else. Okay. But how do human intelligence and artificial intelligence go together? You mentioned the black belts that are needed. Um, so how does the role of the engineer or the operator change? What, do we, what kind of workforce will we need? What kind of capabilities? to run this kind of plants? I think uh, if anything we learned uh, is that uh, this kind of intelligence makes our life more convenient and easy. Think of your home, you have a smart thermostat, you come home, your home is almost warm. People take that for granted, they don't even think about it anymore. Now this kind of comfort we have at home, we don't have yet in the plant. The comfort we have as a driver, do you see threatened by a navigation system in the car or do you see it as a convenience? I guess we all agree that 100, 100 of 100 people see it as a huge convenience, right? It's probably saved so many marriages, unbelievable amount of marriages already, right? <laughs> so, so in the plant, you don't have it. All we're saying, let's catch up with the stuff we already have at home. Let's give our people in the plant the same convenience we have at home. We don't have it. Uh, we somehow, I don't know why, we've been ahead of the game in the 80s and 90s, but we somehow seem to have lost 
the momentum in the last 20 years. So all we are saying, hey, we're bringing stuff that already works well to the chemical industry, into the plant. So the operators are not, they're going to appreciate it because they're going to get help uh, and can put things on autopilot and dedicate attention to problem solving. It's not that we have to get rid of many, many employees anymore. We are super lean in our plants already. We have control rooms where there's one or two people only sitting, but we have 20 monitors. How can one human being constantly observe 20 monitors? That's a huge challenge. So we rather have an opposite problem. We need to give these people help, value-added help, like you give help to, to a driver in the car. Same story. So life is going to be better. It's not a threat. It's really making life a lot easier in complex decision, particularly. So um, looking ahead, will artificial intelligence only be running the plants or can it also one day be creative, create innovation, have new ideas? Do you think artificial intelligence will reach this stage? No, absolutely. Uh, of course. Uh, I mean, uh, it, again, it's an evolution, right? We have always used conventional software already to help us in the design of new products, right? We have had expert systems for a long time already that we're consulting and using to complement our skills. We've had smart searches of databases for patents and other things that give us new ideas and, and, and help us with our creativity process. Now with uh, AI is no different. It just makes things faster. It's able to scan through, I know, a thousand uh, alterations and opportunities at a time are much faster. Well, manually, this would take a much longer time. So in, in, again, I would say AI is just, is just the next step of convenience and, and making things faster and easier. It helps with vaccine uh, development. It helps with uh, simulation, particularly you can then run through multiple variations of simulations in a super fast time, all assisted of course by cloud computing, which gives you the power and the infinite uh, computing and storage capability that you need at time when you need it. So this is kind of the combination of things. Okay. Well, thank you again, Robert, for this insight, very compact, very, very many topics that we could deep dive into, but we will do this at Arma Pulse. So for today, thank you very much for being with us. I look forward to it and I hope uh, I got your attention and interest to join us on June 16th. Look forward to it. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend, Saint. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, well, for all of you who still have questions open or who just started thinking about the potential or maybe uh, the, the catch traps of artificial intelligence in the process industry, you will have the chance to hear much more, to ask more questions at Achama Pulse. It will be a big topic in the Congress and we will have the highlight session with Robert Feldman and Thierry Cartage from Solvay on the 16th of June. So make sure to get your ticket now and we have another two webcasts coming up, the first one on 19th of May on hydrogen and another one on the 1st of June on artificial intelligence. And if you are looking forward to Ahma Pulse, have a look at the program. It's already online. You have a lot of choices. There's so much going on. So start filling up your calendar today. And we're looking forward to seeing you there. Bye.